And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Jeff Neal. Hi guys, my name is Neil. By a show of hands, um, who here has heard of Beyond Corp? Who here is doing Beyond Corp in their company? And is not Netflix? <laughs> okay, keep your hands up, that's great. Okay, good. So we're here to talk to you about Beyond Corp, which many of you guys have heard of. Um, we're gonna separate our talk into two sections. I'll talk for 10 minutes about what is Beyond Corp, and Jeff, um, who helped deploy Beyond Corp at Google, will tell you how he did it. So in 2011, we wrote a research paper called Beyond Corp. This talk, in many ways, will go into more detail than that paper. We've since written two other papers and have a fourth paper coming out soon that goes into detail about what Beyond Corp is and how we deployed it at Google. Uh, it comes as part of a long legacy of taking our internal tools um, and offering it up to anybody. So if any of you guys have used BigQuery, which is part of GCP, um, it began its life as Dremel inside of Google. If you've used Kubernetes, um, which is the number three DevOps tool in GitHub, it began its life as Borg. If you've used TensorFlow, which is relatively new and already number one on GitHub, it's a machine learning framework, it began its life as Brain. Uh, if you've used, um, this one's a little bit different because we didn't really invent it. We just use it a lot within Google. If you've used a security key, then it, its internal name within Google is called Nubby. And I'll talk a bit more about those in a few minutes. If you've used GPRC, that's Stubby. And we're here to talk to you about Beyond Corp. Uh, as Googlers, we use it and it's called Uber Proxy. Okay, so what is Beyond Corp? Well, I can tell you about what it isn't. Um, what it isn't is what many of you guys are using for enterprise security right now, which is a castle approach. You have a moat, you probably have multiple walls, um, the baddies are out, the goodies are in, uh, network segmentation, VPNs to get across that moat and through the walls. Uh, this is how most enterprise security frameworks are done. And we believe for a variety of reasons that it's uh, it's not something that we could maintain, and so in 2011, we began to follow a different approach. So what are the issues with this castle approach? Well, there's four main issues. One, you've got mobile workforces, lots of contractors. Google certainly does. We've got 57,000 employees and lots more contractors than that who shouldn't have access to everything. Uh, also, Googlers shouldn't have access to everything. Um, you've got lots of breaches in the news. You've got cloud services from us and other guys. And you've got a plethora of devices, uh, not just laptops, but iPads and smartphones. Okay, so what is, the, what is the mission? Well, it's essentially to get rid of VPNs. VPNs because network segmentation doesn't work. Uh, VPNs are out also because they're really hard for admins to set up. We've estimated that it takes somewhere like uh, like five full days to deploy Oracle eBusiness Suite using firewalls, site-to-site -side VPNs, um, if you want Oracle eBusiness Suite to be in the cloud. Um, whereas a Beyond Corp approach would take much, much less, much, much fewer firewalls, much fewer load balancer rules, just a lot less work, a lot, lot less opportunity for error. We're big on that at Google. Uh, introduce less error. And so our objective is to have every Google employee work successfully from untrusted networks without the use of a VPN, no network segmentation, and have all applications be publicly addressable. That's the really alarming part. You may have heard of this before. There's other companies that have similar visions. Um, has anybody heard of the zero trust model? Anybody know what company talks about that a lot? Yep, yep, and also Palo Alto Networks. Um, software defined perimeter, anybody heard of that? Who talks about that a lot? Yeah, Cloud Security Alliance, exactly. And Cryptozone and Vitter and a couple other really interesting startups. So yeah, it's a, it's a vision that many of us have. Um, it's just a vision that Google happens to call Beyond Corp. Um, what's unique about Google is we really don't have a product in the space. Um, Palo Alto Networks and Cryptozone and Vitter will happily, and Duo Security will happily sell you uh, softwares in this space. We have three research papers that you're welcome to, to read, but no, no software yet. Okay, so what does this look like in an architecture? Well, I can tell you what it looks like today. So today, 
Um, unless you guys have moved to the cloud, you probably have ERP systems and CRM systems and your identity all located on-prem uh, at a colo or maybe even a wiring closet if you're small. Uh, and you've got your employees over there on the left. Now, this introduces a couple of small problems if you have a contractor that you hire. And then all of a sudden that contractor has unintended access to the CRM because you've given them access to the ERP. Because once they VPN into your walled castle, they all of a sudden have access to everything, including the CRM, uh, if you're running that on-prem. Now what does it look like if you were to put some workloads up into the cloud? Like maybe our cloud or somebody else's cloud? Uh, well, all of a sudden the infrastructure has left the building, and all of a sudden now you need to have site-to-site -site VPNs for your users to, to VPN into your prem, and then you need to have another prem, another, another VPN to go from your on-prem into the cloud. So you've got multiple VPNs, load balancer settings and firewall settings on both sides. This introduces a lot of manual labor for those of us in the room here. Um, for all the end users that are our customers, it introduces a lot of burden. They have to log into one, sometimes two VPNs. It takes a lot of time, up to a minute for each connection. It slows their connections down. It's really not the way that we want to run infrastructure. And it doesn't get easier if you bring the identity into the cloud, for example, like using Okta or something like that. Um, what problems are there with this? So for one, uh, now all of a sudden that your applications are up there in the cloud, you're even more open to phishing than you were before. Uh, phishing is the number one cause of vulnerabilities. More than 80% of hacks begin with phishing, sometimes higher depending on which vendor you talk to. And um, the second big problem is malware like Zeus, which since the applications, ERP and CRM, have no idea about the user at the other side. They're just opening up a VPN connection and then giving them unbridled access um, to those applications. The, the malware can run rampant also and can act on behalf of that user without the knowledge of the user, like Zeus does. Um, you've got man in the middle attacks, which is Zeus also. You've got no choke point to enforce access control for onboarding or offboarding or anything like that. And then of course you have SQL injection. Um, so these are all risks of putting applications up into the cloud. There's lots of benefits of putting them up into the cloud, but these are the, these are the risks. So what would Google do? Well, this is what we do in the space. So we have security keys that are a very good form of phishing control. Does anybody use security keys? Okay, cool. So I brought one here. Um, this is what Google uses. Mine's really tiny. It's going to be hard for you guys to see. It's this. So this confirms a number of things. It confirms that I'm a human because I touch it. Um, it also confirms um, it's less difficult to fish than a phone number is because this is harder to take control of than my phone number is. So it's a little better, well, a lot better in some ways and a little better in others than text messaging as two-factor authentication. That's what we use for device-based authentication. Um, for device management, we maintain inventories. Jeff is going to tell you all about that. Um, the inventories push a certificate to my laptop, which connects this to my laptop so that Google knows that it's actually me touching that button on this laptop. Um, we TLS everywhere. Uh, we have internally something called an access proxy that we haven't made a product. Um, there is a company called Duo Security. I think I saw somebody with a backpack from Duo. They just launched uh, a product last week called Beyond Duo, which is an access proxy in this same kind of vein. You might want to take a look at it. Uh, and then on the app side, to prevent SQL injection and cross-site scripting, we've got app security scans uh, available within our cloud. There's other products too. So these are the solutions that Google would use What would the ideal world look like in a Beyond Corp world? Jeff's going to tell you how we do it. This is sort of like theoretically how we think of it before Jeff built it. Um, so you'd want an ER applica ERP application service to be accessed only by finance employees, not by contractors. Um, from well-managed client devices, for example, you've got a device inventory, uh, and you've got this to confirm that it's a human being operating this laptop, not, not Zeus Botnet, for example. Uh, in my home country, so it could figure out what IP address I'm accessing it from, using strong user authentication, that's security key, uh, proper transport encryption, TLS, and uh, hardened against application attacks, um, a security scanner. 
Okay, so that was a bit about what Beyond Corp can offer for you. Um, Jeff's going to tell you what it offers for Google. Hello, good to see everybody here. Let me get on to the slides here. Uh, basically, what he told you in so many words is what we discovered is that walls don't work. And you can protect yourself with a firewall and all this, you know, inbound security. The problem is that once somebody gets inside that, uh, they typically have access to your entire network. And getting inside of it, yes, and getting inside of it is even easier nowadays with all the mobile devices. That was the point of all these devices. They're coming in on, wired, on wireless networks. They've been out to the rest of the world. They've been plugged into some ISP at the airport or at a hotel, and you don't know what they've injected on their, on their machine. It's hard to trust all these things coming into your previously secure network. So we're doing a different approach. We're saying, let them come in. Let the devices on our network. Well, yeah, our network. It is a segmented network. There's, there's basically, in the old days, we had a client machine network and a server machine network. And the client machines, once you got on there, you could talk to the servers. You could run whatever application you had to run. You could talk to their back end. You could SSH into things. You could run RDP. You could run NFS to pull things off. All those things you could go, we trusted you because you're on our network. You must be a good guy. You can go do, it, do your job, make money for the corporation by talking to the back end. The big thing we did here is saying, all right, all right, all right, we'll have a different client network, and it can only talk to specified access gateways. So even though you get into the city like this, you can't do a transaction. You can't go take the money out of the the bank unless you go to the ATM and prove that you have the right to do that. So we don't protect the street and the city, we protect the application and the data. Now the keys to this whole Beyond Corp are three. One, we don't use the IP address of where you're coming from to prove anything. It's way too easy to get on the wireless network. It's way too easy for somebody to walk in and just plug something into your network. You may have a flash drive on your, on your workstation that is actually driving application code. So being on the network is considered nothing at all. Secondly, we do control the access to the services and the data and all the back ends based on what we, the network and the security operations, know about who's asking about the, com the computer that's asking and about the user that's asking. Uh, knowing about the device is important. That way, random people who have stolen credentials, if they don't have a, in our case, Google managed device, they can't get anywhere. And this is the key to number three, that all the access, each data flow, each connection, each session, each uh, socket setup must be shown to be authenticated to the user and the device authorized, you have a reason to get from here to there, and then we make sure it's all the data are encrypted. So if anybody's watching on the sideline, they can't steal the data from the network or from the Wi-Fi or from the ISP you're going through, wherever it is. We have end-to-end -end encryption, and as you're saying, anybody knows how to do that, but maintaining TLS, so credentials, certificate stores, and all these things is tricky. So embedding that in the system and all the tools is kind of critical to the whole thing. So this is the kind of a high-level picture showing some of the components we have here. I'll go into bits and pieces of this as we go on. But you can see on the, on the left, we have lots of different application or user access modes. We have these access proxy, proxy, access proxy coordinated with our single sign-on process so that wherever you come from, you have to go, get through those. And then we have a universal access control engine that makes all the policy decisions based upon device inventory, user inventory, and other things like that. And we'll just go into those as we go. So first thing is know your users. Who works for the company? Who has the right to do what? How do you know? Can you get people into your company, into your database? Can you kick them out when they get fired or leave the company, whatever else? Having a complete user inventory and groups of users who are in, well, you have this job code, therefore you have a right to look at the finance data. If you have this job code, you can look at the HR data and keep those things separate so that each application user flow can be authorized individually. And I think and this, this, was, this was tricky. I mean, this was development inside Google. Even, even at Google, it was, it was tricky to get all this information coordinated. On the other side is know your devices. Um, it's hard for a, you know, uh, out-of-country actor to infiltrate your thing if they must have one of your devices under their control. Uh, if they're allowed to use any device on the planet, then it's, 
that's just one more barrier. So we have certificate authorities, and we have application acts, applications on the workstations, the whole platform teams, the, o, the OS teams, coordinate to make sure the certificates are installed and secured. We have uh, secure certificate storage, TPMs, trusted platform modules are the best we can do on Mac with their key stores and things like that. But we maintain those, and again, there's, it's an effort to keep the operational things going to keep those up to date and rotated correctly and, and installed correctly, and, and so you can trust in them. Um, likewise, there's a whole inventory control system from delivery and provisioning when you scan the devices in to know where it is, who's the owner of it, who's the user for it, coordinating user access to device access. So if you see this device come up and, well, what's Joe Bob doing on this device? That's not his machine then that's a signal that says perhaps we should have less trust in this coordination because this user should not be on that machine. Is this a Trojan horse pretending to be Joe Bob on, on Sam's machine? Whatever. They're, they're all the signals we're trying to, to capture to know the state of the device. Is it one of ours? Does it have our security credentials on it? Has it checked in with your binary uh, whitelisting application, you know, bit nine or whatever you have to verify that these are being antivirus scanned? Do they have the latest version of the operating system? Is this application even supposed to be on this machine? All these signals are coordinated in this back-end database so we know whether that device is a real, trusted, you know, access using device. And all of these signals are coordinated into a repository, a database, an inference system that says, given all we know about this device, its history, its logs, its usage, where it's been, who it's going to, we can figure out a level of trust in that device. And if it's like a, well, it's a wired workstation in our building behind our door locks, we give it a lot more trust than, ah, it's an iPhone that some Googler says they bought last week. You know, so there's a whole gradation of what we know about the device that determines whether it can have access to critical sensitive data. If all you want to do is check your calendar or look at the, what the cafe menu is, okay, you can do it on your, on, on your phone. But if you want to actually touch the source code or the databases and things like that, you need to have a much more trusted machine to get there. So bringing all those sources of signals together, the user inventory, the device inventory, the trust repository, and then security policy says for any given application or data flow or connection connect type, what do we allow? We bring this all to a central server. All right, which has all the policy rules uniformly expressed across all the sources who want to talk to all the back-end resources. So we can apply this universally and uniformly across all the applications. This, this is one of the things. In the old days, you had to go secure this app and that app and this protocol and that protocol and this router and that firewall. It's really hard to prove at the end of the day that you have allowed or disallowed the access you care about. By having this in a language, an access control language that understands users and machines and levels of access and types of backends, we can express that these kinds of client sources can talk to these kinds of backends on a very fine-grained basis. And the great part about that is once we've dissociated the network address from the access and have it all based on device and user and need to know and proper security protocols in place, then you can do it from anywhere. It doesn't really matter now whether you're in the corporate building in most cases or whether you're in an airport or a hotel or at your home. We have the protocols and the security that will carry the traffic from wherever you are to where you need it to be. So again, a big benefit to Google at this point was that people could do their work from anywhere in the world. Um, you know, modulo what that exact that work was, but the vast majority of web applications for Oh, HR and finance and turning the crank and even code editing can be done over the web these days. Really freed up a lot without using a VPN, which took time to set up. Now you just hit the front end, access proxy, HTTP stuff goes to the back end. So it's very easy, very fast, and very useful. Okay. How did we get to there? I mean, this is a big change in the network. Um, Basically, you're turning off all the access to these applications unless you go through specified gateways, the access proxy or things like that. And just to say, in Google, uh, the access proxy, which is an HTTP proxy, actually services a lot more because we actually like wrap our SSH connections uh, through HTTP, so they go through the same proxy. A slightly different pathway, slightly different, different questions we ask about who's going where, but it's 
a lot of that is the same Google front end, Uber proxy, access proxy. It all is the nexus of these of this traffic flows. Okay, how do we get there? Um, our decision was to, one choice was to say, take our current network, our current engineering, all access, trusted network, which has all these open ports from there to the back ends, and one by one start closing off those ports and making sure people can do their job. That's really dangerous because you really don't know what is out there, who's using what, how often, and things like that. Our approach was to create a new VLAN. Do we all know VLANs? Who, who knows what a virtual LAN is? Okay. This is how you segment who can talk to what. So we made a new VLAN and we said, this VLAN can't talk to anybody. You can't even talk from one workstation to the one sitting right beside it on the same segment. Uh-uh. Because of threats, if you have an infected machine here, you don't want them to migrate to the one sitting next door. So no, you have to go through an access proxy, even to SSH, from your laptop to your workstation. Um, that LAN can talk to the access proxy, which carries web traffic and SSH and a few other things that we carefully craft to go through to get from here to there. But it cannot talk to the server back in VLAN. That's the critical thing. And you can't talk to your neighbor. So it's hard for an infiltrated broken machine, a Trojan horse here, to get to anybody else. And then having that clean, protected space, we then move devices once we know that the user of that device will be successful. All right, so a device wakes up, by the way, there's 8021X if you know about this. It's, you, you device wakes up and says, dear network, what should I do? Where can I go? And the network says, well, show me your certificate. Tell me which device you are. And we look it up and say, do we trust that device? Is it a Google managed device? Is it checked in with Bit9 recently or whatever it is? Okay, you're a good device. You're a Google managed, up to date, top priority. Yes, we'll put you on this managed. You're a managed device. You have the right software and you're a Google client. So we'll put you on this managed, non-privileged network, and now you have a clean, well-lighted place to work, and you can go talk to Uber Proxy or whoever else to get the rest of your job done. The key to this whole migration, though, was to make sure we didn't put anybody on that till we knew that they would be successful. Because you put them on that network, and they have to go run RDP to their Windows server to do some sysadmin work, it'll just fail. If they're running a Java-based RMI fat client application that needs to talk to some system back there, it will fail. If they're running, let's say, finance application that wants an Excel spreadsheet in order to, you know, tabulate things, well, that Excel using Microsoft Office is also going to fail because NFS or CIFS, we don't allow that to go through the network. So we wanted to make sure we found First of all, all the applications that would fail before we moved users over and fix those before we did it. So we got out the network analysis job, NetFlow logs from the routers uh, to see which machines talk, which back ends talk to which front ends over which ports and which protocols. Why are they doing that? And of course, immediately you look at these logs and you say, oh my God, there's traffic like that on my network? <laughs> we thought we got that rid of that three years ago. Well, no, there's more stuff out there than you can imagine. It's, it's not all port 80 HTTP or port 443. There's just applications. You didn't know that your procurement system has deployed these, oh, I shouldn't say Windows applications. I should say third-party applications that do 1980s technology in a way you thought was bad then and it's really bad nowadays. So we find all this analysis, we find who can do what, where, who needs special treatment, and we say, can you fix your application? Can you buy a new application? Can we wrap it in HTTP? If it really is HTTP, why aren't you going through the access proxy? Just reconfigure the system, change DNS, and now you'll all your, your existing URL will go through the controlled access, check for user coordination, check for authentication, and keep on going. So that was the first phase. Find all the bad traffic, get it fixed, find the users who are successful, and then move their devices onto this new network where they're safe and happy. To do that, we automated it. Uh, Google's very big on data and analysis, so we automated this pipeline to look at the network logs. We actually built an on-client application, which is it's IP tables basically, but it watched all their traffic, so we could simulate whether their applications would hit the firewall and fail. And armed with those logs, we could then, again, find things, remediate the applications, find the users, and automatically processing logs, if they were clean for 30 days, the next time they hit the network, they'd go to this non-privileged network. 
this is our vision. We've written a number of papers out here uh, for Usenix. Uh, you'll be able to look at those. I'm running short on time because we started late. Here we go. To do a change of this magnitude, um, you need the whole corporation behind you. Understand the threats, explain it to the executives, get buy-in and, and commitment from the top down. It's not easy and it's not fast to change the way, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people in our case, access and do their job. And you don't want to break the users is the important thing. Clean this up so it works for the users. Data quality is key. Knowing your users, knowing your devices, having an inventory control system, the databases, the ability to process that as near to real time as you can so you can react to various threats. I mean, we've had cases where there's a day zero attack out there and we just say, okay, all these devices, turn them off. They're not allowed on the corporate network anymore until we can get it fixed. Um, enable painless migration. I think my slides have stopped advancing here. Um, which is to say, we do success-oriented migration. Prove that the user will be happy before you move them over. But then be very aggressive moving them over because excuses like, well, my app uses NFS, so I have to stay here, is a bad excuse. We have to get solutions for that. And that goes along with getting everybody on board, really clear, continuous communication, working with management, the business application developers and managers, the actual users, the tech support people, because where do people go when they say, hey, my network stopped failing, what's the problem here? They don't know whether their device is bad, the network is bad, or hey, fails as intended. That's, why, that's what we wanted to have happen. You shouldn't be able to run that app here anymore. Uh, so getting them all on board and keeping the process and the communication clear is really key. And most important to all this, again, is when you move people to these new systems, these databases, these pipelines, this analysis system, this policy engine, this proxy, if any of those fail, what happens? Users can't do their job. Their machines fall off the network. Their packets don't flow. They can't do their job. And in Google's case, that means accounts receivable or accounts payable are not processing that huge flow of money that we know and love. Okay. <laughs> So it's important, I'm saying, to make sure it's reliable because if anything breaks along the way, the amount of confusion and pain and setback to the morale and the productivity is enormous. So be very clear, keep these things going, and then not keep them going because there's a red sign here saying don't. Anyway, there's the synopsis. Have zero trust in the network. Do it at the data level. Uh, get data about your devices, and then carefully, carefully move them over again by data and analysis, and it can be done. Thank you. Hi. Uh, if you would like to hear more about Beyond Corp, we've got security talks happening three blocks down the street from RSA on Tuesday and Wednesday. Just go to a search engine and type in uh, Google security talks and you'll see them. All right, thanks again, guys. So uh, appreciate it. And on behalf of Besides SF and Fitbit, here's a speaker gift for you guys. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your contribution. All right, everybody, it'll be about 10 minutes to the next presentation. Thank you.